Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow, from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore. For the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels named Lenore, nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now to still the beating of my heart I stood repeating. Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. Some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door. This it is and nothing more. Hello, please come uh, in. Oh, yes, hello. I'm... Yes, sir, you are expected. Please come in. Thank you, sir. Not at all. Turbulent night? It is rather nasty out there. And I must forth into it. Do wish me luck. Please, just a moment. If your hours are done, you'll certainly be wanting to head home, but if you would mind first informing your master that I am here. Master, my dear sir, I am not Mr. Usher's servant. I'm a physician. I do beg your pardon. I thought, as you No, are... no, there are no servants here. Not anymore. I sincerely apologize. Your arrival happened to coincide with the end of my appointment, so I told Mr. Usher that I would let you in as soon as I went. He knows that you are here. He asked if you would mind coming to him. Have you been here before, sir? Yes, many times. It has been years, but I remember the house well. He's in the upstairs study. He's expecting you. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Doctor, is Roderick ill? I hope you understand I'm not at liberty to discuss a patient's private... I understand, but I am going to be staying here. I love Roderick like my own brother, but he's not the most forthcoming soul on the planet, and the letter I received from him read like it was written in a fever dream. If I'm going to be staying in a house of contagion, I would like to know it. I'm afraid, my friend, that this is indeed a house of contagion. There is disease here. But it will not infect you. It takes years to incubate. I don't understand. You will. The very best of luck to you, sir. I do mean that. Good evening. My dear friend, I am delighted beyond words to see you. Roderick? My goodness, do I look so bad? No, of course not, only... You've changed a great deal, that is all. It has been many years. Of course. I am very pleased you were able to come. As am I. Roderick, that letter you wrote me was terrifying. I half expected to find you running about the grounds howling at the moon. I apologize if my letter was overly dramatic. I have so few correspondents these days. I am out of practice in penning civilized letters. Do please sit down. Why did you send for me, Roderick? Because I desire to see you. I desire the solace you will afford me. What does it matter? I am suffering from a constitutional and family evil, one for which I despair to find a remedy. A nervous affliction, which will undoubtedly pass off in time. It displays itself in a host of unnatural sensations. I suffer much from a morbid acuteness of the senses. I find only the most insipid of food endurable. I can only wear garments of a certain texture. The odors of all flowers are oppressive. My eyes are tortured by even the faintest of lights. And certain stringed instruments are the only objects capable of producing sound that do not inspire me with horror. On top of all this, I find myself a bound slave to an anomalous species of terror. I dread the events of the future, not in themselves, but in the results. I have no abhorrence of danger except in its effect to raise this terror. In this pitiable condition, I feel the period will soon arrive in which I must abandon life and reason together 
in some struggle with the grim phantasm, fear. Roderick, that is dreadful. Has your doctor suggested a possible cause for- No, but I have not confided in him the full scope of my torment. He is not my doctor. I don't understand. I know the cause, my friend. I need no physician to diagnose it. Indeed, I would be unlikely to find one who would admit the true root of my condition, even if he were to discover it. It is the house, you see. My family have lived in this house for generations, and at no point has the Usher family ever put forth any enduring branch. A family only lies in the line of direct descent, and through the generations, the mansion and the family have become so entwined as to become indistinguishable. There is now no distinction to be made between the House of Usher and the House of Usher. Do you understand that? I think that I do. When we were young, you visited often. You know the house. Does it look different to you now? Of course, but it has been years since. It is not simply a matter of age. In truth, the house has been in decline for decades. And following the death of my parents, its total corruption has accelerated in earnest. The water in the tarn has turned black, stagnant. Cancerous vines throttle the turrets. And the stones in the walls are sicklied over by putrescent fungi. When you approach, did you not notice the fissure that rips from the ground by the lake to the highest parapet? As a matter of fact, I did. Have you made no arrangements to have it repaired? It cannot be repaired. That crack has many branches. It reaches into every room and corridor with skeleton fingers, weakening the house and driving it deeper into sickness. I have not set foot off the grounds in years. The gray walls and turrets, the dim tarn into which they all look down, have wrought a perverse effect on the morale of my existence. You do look, my friend, in a moved sort, as if you were dismayed. Be cheerful, sir, for I am not mad. Yet. Why was the doctor here, Roderick? In truth, this particular gloom which afflicts me can be traced to a more palpable origin. Madeline is ill. Your sister. My twin, yes. You never met her, did you? I never had the pleasure. When you and I met, your father had already sent her to boarding school. He did everything in his power to keep us apart. He feared that we... that there was a danger. Some never spoken of evil that would accelerate between the pair of us. I was groomed to be the lord of the manor, and she was sent away, in hopes that she would escape the dynasty, marry into some uncorrupted family, and shed the burden of the Usher name. And when father died, she returned with a determination to never leave the house again. She has been my sole companion ever since. Madeline? My god, what is the matter with her? The nature of her disease has baffled every physician I've hired. Her death is imminent, I'm afraid. And it will leave me hopeless and frail. The last of the dying race of ushers. And that is the principal reason I have sent for you, my friend. I am on death watch for the better half of my soul, and I would not face it alone. It's arrived for you. Thank you. A poem. From whom? Roderick Usher. Do you not find it unseemly to receive correspondence from a man who is not your husband? Whether I do or do not, it comes. Would you like to hear it? No. It was many and many a year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, 
that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabel Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. I was a child, and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with the love that the winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out of a cloud chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her up in a sepulcher in this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabel Lee. And so all the night tide, I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the sounding sea. It is maudlin, and sentimental, and trite. You once held the opinion that the most poetical subject in the entire world was the death of a beautiful woman. I never said that. You did. That was someone else. Morella, I would request that you cease any further correspondence with Mr. Usher. Poor lonely man. Alone in that big house, with no one but his mad sister to speak to. And you would deprive him of his audience? I have made my request. Why? It's disgraceful. You're about to be a mother. Is that all? Are you not even jealous? Do you wish to make me jealous? I do not wish to make you jealous. But I do wish you were jealous. It would indicate that you still held some sort of tender feeling for me, that perhaps you still loved me. Yes, of course I do. Do you? Is that the reason I am always alone? It is your choice to stay locked away in this house. I wish you would go out. I wish you would make friends. I desire no company but yours. There was a time when you desired no company but mine. We would spend every moment Discussing together. Discussing your interests. Meditating on your obsessions. They were your obsessions as well. Every conversation. Back round to death. Always death. I have tired of it. You mean you have tired of me? And haven't even the courage to leave? I cannot leave you. You cannot now. When I first became ill, I saw it in your eyes. The relief... The excitement. Morella! Do be good enough to admit it. You saw an escape. The child complicates that now. Try not to look too disappointed, my love. She may very well kill me. It could be a boy. She is not. Morella, I have only ever wanted happiness for you. You are the only one with the power to make me happy. The child will. We shall see. Please. Never think. I do not hate you, Morella. I never could. But perhaps I am afraid of you. If you loved me, you would have no cause to fear me. Presently, my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir? Said I. Or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. 
But the fact is I was napping and so gently you came rapping and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there and nothing more. Welcome, all of you. Do please come in. Oh, this is lovely. Are all the dormitories at Eton like this? Hardly. My room is barely larger than a wardrobe. Our illustrious host has the uncanny ability to secure luxuries that the rest of us only dream of. God alone knows how he does it. No, not alone. And do not complain about your lodgings in front of your fellow fourth years. You do know this splendid apartment shall be yours in a few days. Of course you secured it for him. Were you under the impression I would leave it to you? As our companions apparently lack the most rudimentary of manners, allow me to introduce myself. There is no need. Tonight, you are Miss Hartz. And I shall call you Miss Diamonds. I do have a perfectly good name, sir. Her father paid handsomely for it. I wholly believe you do, Miss Diamonds. However, you have forbidden from uttering it. When the Brotherhood gathers, we and our guests must each of us adopt a nom de guerre. It is the most ancient law of our order. And exactly how ancient is your order? About six months. We have been meeting for a bit longer, but I did not set down the true and venerable laws until the middle of last term. And what shall we call you then? Tonight I shall be William Wilson. That's rather dull. His true name is rather dull. Alas, Mr. Spades is correct. So you are Mr. Spades? Apparently, Mr. Wilson, was it? Mr. Wilson insists on naming everyone. He is the atom of our little paradise lost. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Spades, if you insist on comparing me to a Miltonian figure, it should not be Adam. God, then. No, not him either. Do swallow that anger, old boy. Remember that salons are terrible places for secret keeping and I have dutifully kept many of yours. Also, it was only white wine. So what are we to call you then? I don't know yet. This is the Lady Spades. And what do we call you, sir? This is Dauphin, the heir to the throne, as it were. It is in his honor that we gather here tonight, as I am shortly to be departing for Oxford. He will take my place as head of the Brotherhood. He is quite your little doppelganger. No, you idiot. He is not my doppelganger. Please refrain from using words you do not know the meaning of. I know! Astoundingly little for an eaten upperclassman. <laughs> the Dauphin is my protege, not the same thing at all. I did actually have a doppelganger once, you know? Did you? Indeed. My primary schooling was undertaken at a small academy presided over by a dreadful clergyman called Dr. Bransby. It is a peculiarity of my character that I have always risen to the apex of whichever social set I found myself a part of. All the students tended to defer to me, all save one for whom the sake of tonight I shall call William Wilson. I thought you were William Wilson. Tonight I am, and so tonight was he. It is not as strange as it might sound. As Mr. Spades charitably observed, notwithstanding my noble descent, mine is one of those everyday appellations which seem to have been time out of mind, the common property of the mob, and this other shared my rather plebeian name. Oh, I see. What was that? Not your concern at the moment. In addition to a name, this other and myself shared a nativity. We were born on the same day, the same year. We arrived at the academy at the same time, and there was a marked similarity in our appearance. This was offensive enough, he being, as I took it, from one of those families whose gross commonality was heralded by our shared name. We remained cordial for a few years and might have eventually become friends, but for his absolute refusal to take my lead on anything, 
Indeed, though he was a grim, humorless child, he did seem to take some private pleasure in thwarting my plans and intentions. I grew to despise no one in the world so much as him. <coughs> to add insult to the injury, the other began to dress in the same manner as myself, and, though he was afflicted by a weakness in the guttural organs which precluded him from raising his voice at any time above a whisper, he still managed to convey himself at all times in a perfect imitation of myself, both in words and in actions. This enraged me to no ends, particularly as I seemed to be the only one who noticed it. Such was the subtlety of his mockery. Did you never have it out with him? I did. My last afternoon at the academy, I broke with all feigned politeness and gave him a proper thrashing in the schoolyard. Afterwards, he spoke and acted with an openness of demeanor rather foreign to his nature. I fancied I discovered in his bearing at that moment a something which brought to mind dim visions of my earliest infancy. Wild, confused, thronging memories of a time when memory herself was yet unborn. I felt that I had been acquainted with the being who stood before me at some epoch very long ago. The delusion, however, faded rapidly as it came. That night, I crept into his dormitory after hours with the intent to do something to him. I had forgotten precisely what. Perhaps I did not know at the time. I stood over him in the dark, watched him sleeping. His face was so much like my own. I thought as I looked down upon him, is this... Is this William Wilson? Are these the lineaments of William Wilson? I saw indeed that they were his, but I shook as with a fit of ague and fancying they were not. What was there about him to confound me in this manner? Was he truly my double as I so believed? Nobody else had ever remarked upon the resemblance. Was it possible that what I saw was merely the result of his constant sarcastic imitation? Awe-stricken and with a creeping shudder, I passed silently from the chamber and left at once the halls of that old academy to never enter them again. There is something in that trunk. Indeed there is. For the Dauphin's investiture, the true and venerable laws demand a sacrifice. What you have been hearing are the bleats of the lamb I have procured for that purpose. Prince Dauphin? Yes, Mr. Williams? Fetch the lamb. You haven't got a real animal in there. Indeed we do. A third year of questionably adequate breeding who has been obnoxiously insistent about attending one of our little feats. Only he has also made it clear he never touches liquor and disapproves of immoral behavior. Prince Dauphin, you may remove his bridle. There you go, little lamb. Please let me go. I swear I will not say a word. For God's sakes, let him go. First, we must have a toast in honor of our Dauphin. Mr. Spades, will you please pour a glass of the Amontillado for our little lamb, so he may join us? Please, I don't want it. It's very sweet. Yes, little children are fond of sweet things, I'm told. Do you want me to untie his hands? No, no, just give the glass to the Dauphin. He will administer the drink for the lamb. What if he refuses to open his mouth? Well, he may drink it or he may wear it. Please. Brothers, ladies, little lamb, a toast in honor of the Dauphin, who shall lead you after I am gone. And in his name, I raise my glass to the devil. In all the pleasures he affords, we poor doomed souls. I am not going to drink to that. Mr. Spades, I ask for the compliance of your guest. Shall I have it? Or shall I have two lambs to slaughter this evening? To the devil, then. Ooh. Oh, take him out. I can't have him vomiting on the floor. What shall we do with him? <laughs> yes, we still must have a sacrifice. This will be your first act as leader. Take him out to the courtyard and bind him to the statue of Henry VI. Then, take this knife and relieve him of his clothing. If this is too indelicate for the ladies, they may depart before the disrobing. Once he is secure, we shall all to bed. You mean to just leave him there like that? Oh, it will be dawn in a few hours. He'll be found before long. And the weather is very pleasant tonight. We are not monsters after all. I shall scream in the hallways on the way out to the courtyard, I swear! No! 
No, you shall not. <sighs> Run along now. Are you not coming with us? No, I will join you momentarily. The Dauphin must do this without my assistance and without getting caught. Get into the statue, but do not begin the sacrifice until I join you. Oh, Dauphin, you still have so much to learn. Forget something, did you? You better come back and get it, otherwise... Greetings, old friend. I apologize for not visiting you sooner. I intended to. You have had much need for me in this place. What must I do? That is your choice. What must I do to make you go away? Leave now, like a thief in the night. Bid no one farewell. Set out for Oxford and there begin a new life, where my presence will not be necessary. If I do this, will you leave me be? If you do all this, I will. Deep into that darkness peering, long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, and the stillness gave no token. And the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore? This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore. Merely this, and nothing more. In the greenest of our valleys, by good angels tenanted, once a fair and stately palace, radiant palace, reared its head. In the monarch, thought's dominion, it stood there. Never seraph spread a pinion over fabric half so fair. Banners yellow, glorious golden, on its roof did float and flow. This, all this, was in the olden time long ago. And every gentle air that dallied in that sweet day, Along the ramparts plumed and pallid, a winged odor went away. Wanders in that happy valley, through two luminous windows saw, Spirits moving musically, to a lute's well-tuned law, Round about a throne where sitting, Porphyrogene, In state his glory well befitting, the ruler of the realm was seen. And all with pearl and ruby glowing was the fair palace door, through which came flowing, 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 and sparkling evermore, a troop of echoes whose sweet duty was but to sing, in voices of surpassing beauty the wit and wisdom of their king. But evil things and robes of sorrow assailed the monarch's high estate. Ah, oh, let us mourn, for never morrow shall dawn upon him desolate. And travelers now within that valley, through the red litten window see vast forms that move fantastically to a discordant melody, while like a ghastly rapid river through the pale door, a hideous throng rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. One of yours? I believe so. I do not recall having read it anywhere. Do you know, I have been unable for the past half hour to leave contemplating this picture. Oh, I painted that some years ago. What does it signify? I have no idea. I am not presently the person who created it. What do you mean by that? The painting is of no significance. Come here. I wish to show you something. Look here, and tell me what you see. I see toadstools. No. A related but distinct fungus which I have scraped from the westernmost wall of the house. They cover nearly every inch of the stones. Are you familiar with the theories of Spallanzani or Dr. Percival or the Bishop of Landoff concerning the sentience of all vegetable things? I'm afraid not. These fungi emanate an evil intelligence. 
It is probable you are not able to feel it because you are not cursed, as I am with such morbidly acute sensibilities. But this dark consciousness pervades the whole estate. The evidence of the sentience can be found in the condensation of an atmosphere of their own about the waters and the walls. An atmosphere of their own? Yes! By they you mean? The vegetation, the fungi, the trees! I see. The result of this atmosphere created by this malign vegetable intelligence is that silent, yet importunate influence which has molded the destiny of my family and made me what you now see. How's Madeline? I've not seen her for a day or more. She has betaken herself to her bed. I do not expect her to return from it. What were the evil things? What? In the poem, the evil things in robes of sorrow. What were they, and why did they kill the king? Oh, it could have been anything. Madness, dark inclinations, melancholy. In the end, it matters not. As for the king, they destroyed him, because he wished them to. Why would he wish that? It is in his nature. It is in all of our natures, I think. Every living creature seeks its own annihilation. You cannot truly believe that. I can, and I do. Have you ever stood at a precipice, a ledge overlooking some great height, and felt, if only for a moment, the inexplicable urge to leap off into the void? There is a little demon inside all of us that whispers unwholesome things. I have heard it called the Imp of the Perverse, but I forget by whom. It undermines our rational thoughts and drives us to ruinous acts. The Imp of the Perverse is what persuades the fat man to eat another cake when he knows that his girth is one treat away from strangling his heart. It is what compels the dipsomaniac to pour the glass of brandy that will kill her. It is the impulse that can transform the most healthy and logical of our species to so many prosperous, madly pursuing our own destruction. I never read Prospero that way. He seeks to end his exile and renounces his unearthly power, but above all else, I find him a figure of forgiveness, not self-annihilation. I am not speaking of Shakespeare's sorcerer. I am referring to the other Prospero, though I can see the name was likely an homage. I'm afraid I'm only familiar with Shakespeare's. Of course, the second is not so well known. He appears in a court mask, probably from the reign of James I. I have a copy here. Is it one of Ben Jonson's? I doubt it. Johnson did not include it in his works. There's no evidence that it was ever performed, and the only extent copies attribute no author. Would you like to hear it? I should be delighted. If it were ever staged, it would have begun with the players outfitted for a masquerade, save for one, attired as a wretched and suffering peasant. Once the king and queen had taken their places, a single chorus member would step between them. Alas, there is no indication in the text of the manner in which it was outfitted. It says only a grim and saturnine chorus steps forth. Do you think you could be sufficiently saturnine for the role? Old boy, I hope you will not be offended if I observe that you fit that description rather more than I. Ah, but I must be Prospero. I know the role, and there's only one copy to read from. I will give it my best effort. The Red Death long had lay waste to this land. No pestilence was e'er so hideous. Blood was its avatar, its sanguine seal, the redness and the horror of the blood. First came sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then a profuse bleeding at the pores, ending with disillusion of the wretch, the slick and scarlet stains upon the body, and primarily upon the victim's face served as a ban which shut him out from thade and sympathy of all his fellow men and the entire life of the disease from seizure to progress and terminus were but the incidents of half an hour but prince prospero was dauntless and shrewd when his dominions half were desolate depopulated by the red death's touch he summoned to the splendor of his court a thousand hale and feather-hearted friends 
My lords and ladies all, we shall retire into seclusion and safety here within my castle, so long as we must. A strong and lofty wall girdles us in. This wall has gates of iron, which will seal by welding tight the bolts within the lock. We here resolve to leave no means so air of ingress to or egress from this place. The abbey is amply provisioned with food and drink enough for years to come. With these precautions, we shall be defiant to the contagion that despoils our land. The outside world can take care of itself. Tis folly in this place to think or grieve. Our prince hath here provided us with all thy appliances of pleasure to distract. Here are buffoons and improvisatory. And ballet dancers and musicians. Here is beauty and here too is wine. These and safety are all here within. And my dear friends, the red death is without. <laughs> It was toward the close of the sixth month of his seclusion from the raging plague that Prospero entertained his thousand friends at an unusually splendid masquerade. It was beyond voluptuous, that scene. He held it in a suite imperial of seven rooms connected in a maze of sudden turns and doorways. Every room was dominated by a tall window of stained glass lit from a hall without by flames that cast their rays back through the tint and glaringly illumined all within. The color of the glass in every room was varied in accordance with the hue that prevailed in the decoration of the chamber into which it opened. The easternmost room was all furnished with ornaments and tapestries and rugs. A vivid blue and all its window panes were tinted blue as well. The second room was hung and painted in purple, and the third was green throughout, and so were its casements. The fourth was furnished in lit orange. The fifth was white. The sixth, bright goldenrod. The seventh chamber, furthest to the west, was shrouded close by velvet tapestries of inky black that hung all over the room and down the walls falling in heavy folds upon a carpet of the same tenebrous hue. But in this chamber only the panes of glass did fail to correspond with the decor. The window here was scarlet, deep blood red, and the effect from firelight without streaming upon the midnight colored room through bloody tinted panes produced a look so wild and ghastly on faces within that there were few of the company bold enough to set foot in the seventh room at all. It was in this apartment that there stood against the western wall an ebony clock whose clanging voice when heard upon the hour was of so strange a note and emphasis that at each lapse of hour all would pause to hearken to the sound and while it rang the giddiest grew pale and the more aged passed hands over their brows as if confused. But when the echo chimes had fully ceased, the revelers all laughed at their own fear. The music and the dancing all resumed, and all was light and frivolous and safe until the moment of the next hour's chime. At the eleventh hour in the halls, as revels went whirlingly on and on, there were not a few people in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of a new presence unremarked before. A masked figure, hitherto unseen by any of the prince's revelers, the rumor of this unknown visitor having spread itself whisperingly about, there at length rose from the whole company a murmur expressive of indignance, then finally of horror and disgust. In the hearts of the most reckless there are chords, which cannot be without emotion struck, to even he for whom both life and death are taken both as fodder for the jest. There are some matters so profound and grim that no jest can be sanely made of them. All of our company do deeply feel that in the stranger's bearing and her dress, propriety and wit are absent whole. She's shrouded head to foot as for the grave, and wears a visor of a stiffened corpse, so lifelike in its features and its form. Or death-like, rather, that is more correct. That closest scrutiny will not detect the cheat, but rather make the viewer swear the mask to be the truth of what it mocks. Assure yourselves, my friends, there has ne'er been a masquerade unvisited by death. Why, I myself, upon last carnival, went skull-faced in a cloak of ebon black, 
And if this lady, whomsoe'er she be, hath frightened all of you with her disguise, she is to be commended, not condemned, for tis the point of masking death to fright. My lord, this is no playful guise of death. The woman is bedecked all o'er with blood. Her costume mocks with cruel veracity the plague that e'en now devastates our land. Then, as if summoned by the courtier's words, the spectral image stepped into the room. Who dares insult us with this mockery? Who dares affront us with this blasphemy? Seize her at once and tear the hateful mask from off her face that we may see who tis that we shall hang at sunrise from the walls. Unmask her now! Unmask! 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 The pale and frightened courtiers did not move, but watched as this grim phantom passed within a yard of the great person of the prince, and then with stately step deliberate, made her determined way out of the room. Prince Prospero, now mad with rage and shame at his own momentary cowardice, rushed after the strange masquerade through the rooms of blue and purple, green and orange, white and goldenrod, with his sharp rapier drawn. When Prospero approached within three feet of his unwanted guest, they had both passed into the black apartment, and she turned and face to face confronted her pursuer. The prince emitted a lone, strangled cry and dropped his gleaming rapier on the floor, then fell prostrate himself in sudden death. Then, in the desperate courage of despair, a throng of revelers at once rushed in and took the mummer violently in hand, but recoiled in unfathomable dread at finding the grave's cerements and mask untenanted by any form at all. The presence of the Red Death was confirmed. She had come like a rubber in the night, and one by one the revelers did drop in all the prince's blood bedewed halls, and died each in the posture of their fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with them, and the flames in all the tripods did expire, and darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Good evening. Do come in. I thought you were never going to make it. Good evening, Miss Preston. I do apologize. I was rather held up. Oh, that's all right. You will have to wait until the next round of play, I'm afraid. Oh, I am only here for the wine. Not the cards. You know that. What is the game tonight? Ecarte. Lord Glendinning is losing rather badly to a man from Magdalen College. One of the Dons? No, a student. I wonder if I know him. What is his name? William Wilson. No. Doesn't ring any bells. Mind you, I did know some Williamses in Bath. Perhaps he's a scion of that tree. I've no idea. He is quite secretive about himself. I think I heard him say he was at Eton, but that is the extent of my knowledge. Who else is here? Mr. and Mrs. Page. They have been wagering on Mr. Wilson and very glad of it. Mr. Nightshade is backing Lord Glendinning, and I'm certain that he regrets that. Mrs. Nightshade, as usual, is performing a sort of a general director of activities. Shall we join them? Please. Clubs are the trump suit. I propose. Should I accept? I would, my lord. How many? Three. I will also take three. I play. Queen of diamonds, nine of diamonds, Mr. Wilson takes the trick. Well done, sir! Queen of Diamonds, Seven of Clubs, his lordship takes the trick. Doing a bit better, I'd say. Yes. Are you certain you don't want to back out, Paige? We wouldn't dream of it, Mr. Nightshade. King of Hearts, Ten of Clubs, Mr. Wilson takes the trick. There we are! Queen of Clubs, Ace of Clubs. Damn it! 
Oh, forgive me. Mr. Wilson takes the trick and the hand. One point for Mr. Wilson. The score stands thus. Two points for Mr. Wilson and four points for his lordship. Does anyone wish to raise their wager before the next hand? Not us. Sorry, old man. You're too far behind. So it would seem. I'll stay. Mr. Wilson? It would be rather foolish to me at this juncture, would it not? My lord? My lord, are you quite sure? Here, Mr. Wilson. That is a substantial sum, my lord. You may, of course, forfeit, if you wish. I'm afraid my foolish pride will not permit that. Mr. Wilson, he needs only one point to win. And I need three. Yes, Mrs. Page, I do know the rules. My lord. Heart of the Trump suit. How fortunate for you, my lord. I myself have no heart. I propose. May we see your hand, Mr. Wilson? I think not. You may let us advise, you know. We are wagering on you. Yes, I am still aware of the rules, Mrs. Page. Mr. Wilson, I propose. I'm sorry, my lord. I must decline. And I wish to show the King of Hearts. One point for Mr. Wilson. King of spades, king of hearts, Mr. Wilson takes the trick. Oh, you don't lead with that. Darling! I didn't lead with it. I trumped with it. Now I am leading. King of clubs, knave of clubs, Mr. Wilson takes the trick. Oh, very good. King of diamonds, seven of diamonds, Mr. Wilson takes the trick. Come on, my lord. Queen of hearts, seven of hearts, Mr. Wilson takes the trick. Never doubt of you for a moment, old boy. Ace of hearts, knave of spades. This is vol for Mr. Wilson. Two points, plus the point for showing the king. Mr. Wilson takes the hand and the game. Bravo! Well done indeed. Does anyone else wish to have a go? Mr. Nightshade? Sir, I have lost enough money on account of you tonight. Besides, I'm certain you'll wish to give his lordship a chance to win back some of his own. No. I have nothing else to put up. I owe this man all I have. I'm quite ruined. Perhaps his lordship wishes to take this hand as a practice round? Do not patronize me, sir, and do not insult me. My lord? I will pay what I owe. Even all you have? Excuse me. Yes, what is it? Who are you and how did you get inside? Miss Preston, please forgive my intrusion. I have urgent and important information for you and your friends. I'm sorry, to whom am I speaking? I am not of any importance. Only my news is. Oh, let him in, Miss Preston. Perhaps you'll fancy a game. Get in some new blood and we shall... Ladies and gentlemen, I do apologize for this behavior, because in thus behaving, I am fulfilling a duty. You are, beyond doubt, unaware of the true character of the person who has tonight won at Ecarte a large sum of money from Lord Glenville. I will therefore put upon you an expeditious and decisive plan of obtaining this very necessary information. Please examine at your leisure the several small packages which may be found in the somewhat capacious pockets of his coat. There are three packs of cards in here. I always bring spares just in case an active card in the deck should be damaged. Surely you do not mean to accuse me of- If you examine them, Miss Preston, you will find that the court cards are slightly convexed at the end and the lower cards slightly convexed at the sides. In this disposition, the dupe who cuts, as customary, the length of the pack will invariably find that he cuts his antagonist in honor, while the gambler, cutting at the breath, well, has certainly cut nothing for his victim which may count in the records of the game. 
That does appear to be the case. Also, you will find more anomalies in the inner lining of the cuff of his left sleeve. All of the court cards. Mr. Wilson, I presume it is unnecessary to seek here of any further evidence of your skill. Indeed, we have had enough. You will see the necessity, I hope, of leaving Oxford. In all events, of leaving instantly my home. Doctor. I'm afraid she has little time left. The birth was complicated. The child? My nurse is attending to her in the adjoining room. I shall try to do what I can for her. She is breathing, yet barely so. She is yet to cry. It is a girl, then? Yes. I must attend to her at once. Of course. Thank you, Doctor. Is it you, my love? I am here, Marilla child is a girl. I told you she was. The doctor says she is yet to cry. She will. Well, then I suppose we had better give her a name. Will you not come to me? Will you not hold my hand? What would you like for her name to be? That will be up to you. I shall never call her anything. Lo, tis a gallant knight within the lonesome latter years, an angel throng, bewinged, bedight in veils and drowned in tears. Sit in a theater to see a play of hopes and fears, while the orchestra breathes fitfully the music of the spheres. Mimes on the form of God on high mutter and mumble low, and hither and thither fly, mere puppets they who come and go, at the bidding of vast formless things, shifting the scenery to and fro, flapping from out their condor wings, invisible woe, that motley drama, oh be sure, it shall not be forgot, with its phantom chased forevermore by a crowd that sees it not, returneth in a circle to the self-same spot where much of madness, more of sin and horror the soul of the plot. But see, amid the mimic root, a crawling shape intrude, a blood-red thing that rides from out the scenic solitude. It rides, it rides, the mimes become its food. With angels sob at vermin fangs in human gore imbued. Out, out are all the lights, out all. And over each quivering form, the curtain of funeral pall comes down with the rush of a storm. And all of the angels, all pallid and wan, uprising, unveiling, confirm that the play is the tragedy man, and its hero, the conqueror worm. Another cheerful verse from Mr. Usher? No, I haven't heard from Mr. Usher in months, not with someone else. Please hold my hand. Your fingers are cold. It is the day of days, a day to either live or die. A fair day for the sons of life and earth, and more fair for the daughters of heaven and death. Will you kiss me? I wish, above all, that you would have loved me. That she who in life you did abhor, in death you shall adore. Morella. I am dying. But within me is a pledge to that little affection which you once did hold for me. When my spirit departs, our child shall live. 
but your hours of happiness are over. Your days shall be days of sorrow. You shall bear about you your shroud upon the earth. Marilla, how can you know this? Farewell, my love. Until we meet again. She is gone. Roderick. Madeline is dead. She must be taken to the vault below the house. I require your assistance, for I... I cannot touch her. Do you not wish to say something? There will be time for elegies anon. She will only be here for a fortnight, then I shall move her to the family crypt. It's a peculiar tradition of ours. For now, let us let her rest in peace. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning. Soon I heard a tapping, somewhat louder than before. Surely, said I. Surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is. In this mystery explore, let my heart be still a moment. In this mystery explore, tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter, in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady, perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance of war. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's plutonian shore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly. Though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door. Bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door with such name as nevermore. But the raven sitting lonely on the placid bust spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour, nothing farther than he uttered not a feather than he fluttered, till I scarcely more than muttered. Other friends have flown before. On the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store. Caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster till his songs one burden bore. To the dirges of his hopes that melancholy burden bore of never, never more. Where have you been? I've been calling for you. I've been in here most of the morning. You spend too much time in your mother's room. I should like to spend more. I should like to sleep in here. No, we have discussed this. What are you reading? Schelling. It was a favorite of hers. How do you know that? Was it not? It was, but I am certain I have never spoken of it with you. She made a great many notes in this book.
I do not want you reading this any longer. Come, we will, we will go for a walk on the grounds. I want to visit Mother's grave. No, I have told you. But I want to go into the town. There is nothing in the town that you need. I want to speak to someone my own age. You would not enjoy it. I believe it would disturb you. Because there is something unnatural about me. No, not you, my darling. Just the manner of which you are aging. Your physical and mental developments are simply more accelerated than most. In body and mind, you appear to nearly be an adult. And if I were to meet another child, she'd want to know my name, I suppose. Most children of ten do have names, don't they? I am an anomaly in that regard. You have had ten years to name me, father. Is that not a sufficient length of time to make a decision? Darling, surely by now you must have named yourself. There is something you call yourself in your mind. Of course there is. At times. Will you not tell me what it is? I dare not. If I may not go out of the house, and I may not to speak to anyone other than you, then you must allow me what few entertainments I can find here. Please return that book to me, Father. No. I will find you something better. Something more wholesome. Was there nothing wholesome in Mother's interests? Your mother was ill. Disturbed. I do not want you to become what she became. What did she become, then? I believe that I have the right to know. Was she a witch? A demon? Of course not. Don't be ridiculous. Then what was she? I do not see how I may avoid her influence when her spirit haunts every corner of the house that you will not permit me to leave. Please do not speak nonsense. How may I avoid her influence when everything I see was hers? When I have nothing to do all day except to read her books, look at her paintings, walk through the shadows of your memories of her. There are times, Father, and their frequency is increasing when I can feel her inside my head as though she were speaking to me through my own skull. At times I can feel her speaking through my mouth. I have an opportunity, a business opportunity in Rome. I had considered turning it down, however, how would you feel about going abroad for a few years? Do you mean it? Perhaps you are right about the house, about her presence here. Maybe it is better for the both of us to shut it up for a few seasons, see a different piece of the world. I would like that very much, Father. You shall have to learn Italian, and living in another country will not alter the fact that you will most likely find no common interest with children your own age. You might, however, find companionship with a young lady or two, that of the age which you seem to be. When shall we leave? It will take a few days to make the arrangements. I believe we may depart early next week. Thank you, Father. Thank you. But the raven still beguiling my sad fancy into smiling. Straight I willed a cushion seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking, I betook myself to linking. Fancy unto fancy, thinking what this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt, and ominous bird of yore, meant in croaking nevermore. This I sat, engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl, whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining, on the cushion's velvet lighting that the lamplight floated o'er. But whose velvet violet lining, with the lamplight floating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Are you lost, pretty one? Forgive me, sir, but I must point out that you have no means of knowing whether I am pretty or not. Of course I do. There, you see? As lovely as summer's day. Please return that to me at once. In a moment, perhaps. First, we must discuss your incivility. My incivility? I approached you with a compliment and a friendly offer of help. You responded rudely. You have yet to even pay me the courtesy of a smile. Sir! And because you have made it necessary that I, ungallantly, must point out your lack of manners, I find it only fair that you must reciprocate my efforts with a smile, plus interest. What interest would that be, sir? A kiss, little Rudesby. A smile and a kiss. 
and you may have your mask back. You have rather overplayed your hand, sir. Have I? Well, let us begin with your name, then. I cannot tell you that. Is that a challenge, my dear? I am here, father. Ah, here you are. I had feared I had lost you. Father, this man... Good evening, sir. I had just noticed that your charming daughter had dropped her visor in the street, most carelessly. I was returning it to her. Thank you, sir. I do hope the both of you will stay near. There is to be a performance presently. It seems quite pleasant. Thank you. Do enjoy the festival, sir. Miss. Was that man behaving indecently towards you? Yes, but it was a situation I could manage perfectly well on my own. I'm certain of that. Is that all? Are you not even jealous? What? That is not what I meant to say. Not the right word. Do you know what was the most troubling about that exchange? He demanded my name. He also demanded a smile and a kiss, and I could easily deny him those. But the fact that I have no name to even deny him... Blaggard! Let us leave this place. I knew it was folly no, to- No, please, Father, I want to see the performance. Very well. After the Mass, tomorrow, I shall ask the priest to perform your christening. Do you mean it? I do. Thank you, Father. Do not wander off again. The streets are wild and dangerous tonight. Oh, Father, so long as you love me, you will never have cause to fear me. so keenly alive to a joke as the king. He seemed to live only for laughter and mirth, for a phrase or a trick that would jiggle his girth. And to humor the king, put a smile on his face, was the surest of paths to lead into his grace. And he had seven ministers, fat as can be, who were all of the same mirthful nature as he. We do spend all our wit and our wisdom and guile in the hourly effort to make our king smile. At the date of our narrative, twas still the fashion of monarchs who had a particular passion for jesting and japing and jibing in sport to retain as a prevalent presence in court. A professional jester, a motley deck clown, who must always stand ready to tickle the crown. And our king was no different, he had such a fool, a witty and brilliant lord of misrule, who was prized by the king for his wit to be sure, but more for his body whose form and contour was so dwarfish and twisted of back and of limb, that the king felt a laughing just looking at him. What the jester's name was, I cannot truly say, for the king never used it, but from the first day that the dwarf to this kingdom of jollity came, the king had demanded the flattering name of Hopfrog be put on the strange little clown, and so he was known both in court and in town. From what country he came, I can also not say. It was some place exotic and quite far away. And when he was brought as a gift to the throne, as a general's conquest, he was not alone. A lady was with him when smaller than he, but lovelier than our Hopfrog was ugly. Her name was Trippetta, she was the king's joy. He held her to be his most beautiful toy. For she was a dancer so graceful and spry, she could move the most hard-hearted scoundrels to try. On some grand sit occasion, I forget what, said the king to his ministers. I've had a thought. On this grand state occasion, we'll delight all with an opulent, decadent masquerade ball. Oh, my lord, oh, my liege, what a brilliant conceit. We shall laugh off our faces and dance off our feet. So bring me my toys, both the fool and the girl, for there is no singular soul in the world who can plan for a festival as well as she, nor any as gifted at mumming as he. When the two little friends made their way to the king, they found him and his ministers all partaking and sweet Spanish wine, which they quaffed to their brains, were as pickled and dull as a barman's remains. Have a drink, little hop frog, imbibe and be merry, and give us all characters what gnome or fairy, or vampire, ghoul, demon, or ghost, will incite all our maskers with terror the most. Oh, my master, I'll give you a costume divine, but I beg of your pardon, I cannot drink wine, for it chokes me and turns my mind mad as a bull, and madness, my lord, is not comfortable. You will drink it, I say, by the fiends you will do. You will do anything that I demand of you. Oh, my lord, please, my liege, do not force on him wine. 
For him it is vile and unwholesome as brine. I beg you, master, it causes them pain. Have pity on him and let Hot Frog abstain. The court was shocked silent by Trippetta's gall, and the monarch, without saying one word at all, threw her down to the ground and to add more disgrace, threw all of his wine into Trippetta's face. And the room was quite silent, a moment or three, then shouted the Harlequin, Your Majesty, I've just now remembered a frolic divine. It comes from our country, Trippetta's and mine, and it's terrified many right down to the bone, and here in this land, it is wholly unknown. So your Majesty might guess what wonderful fear you may stir up if you were to enact it here. But alas, I know not if twill serve in the end, for this devious frolic requires eight men. Here we are, little fool. Can you not count or see? There are eight with my minister, seven and me. Oh, my lord, oh, my liege, you're more clever than I. Eight indeed, here they are. Very well, we shall try to transform this old jovial or jocular gang into eight hideous chained orangutans. All your guests in their masks and their frilled frippery will believe you've escaped from a menagerie, and the men will all scream without hold or restraint, and a number of ladies are likely to faint. What a laugh, what a jest, and not part of the jade to be transformed by this lovely fool into apes. Hot Frog's mode of equipping the party as apes was quite simple, but they are not difficult shapes. First, the men were all squeezed into garments of black, which constricted the front and nigh crippled the back. And then, head to toe, they were all slathered with tar, and the finishing touch was more brilliant by far. For a layer of flax, that would serve as the fur, was applied to each inch of each portly monsieur. And then lastly, the party of jokers were braced by a chain that wound round each great primate's great waist. The orangutans waited the night of the ball until midnight, then after the lights nearly all had been lowered and all of the guests stood in gloom, the eight chained orangutans burst in the room. There were screams, there were faints, there was crying and shout, and a great many revelers tried to run out. But the room had been locked and the singular key was in Hop Frog's possession for security. In the tumult and chaos of frenzy and dread, no one noticed that from far, far up overhead, by means of a crank there began to descend a ponderous chain with a hook on one end. And the gleeful orangutans were unawares when Hot Frog entangled that great chain with theirs, so the king and his ministers were quite surprised when the dwarf turned the crank and they started to rise, high above all their guests, and when finally the clown ceased his hoisting, they were too far up to come down. And grabbing a torch from a holder nearby, the lithe little gesture, so strong and so spry, climbed straight up a tapestry swung from a cornice. It's likely he practiced his action before this. And in his free hand, he caught the chain from which hanged, the distressed and terrified orangutans. Fear not, lords and ladies, for I shall make plain what monsters now hang from this monstrous chain. I now see distinctly, so clearly I see, what manner of people these monkey men be. A king who does not think it any disgrace to strike a small girl and throw wine in her face, and seven obsequious boot-licking dogs who abet all the crimes of the sovereign og. As for myself, I'm simply a clown, a slave, duty bound to make jokes for the crown. And this joke is my last, I'll depart here tonight. Oh, but first, I shall bring to this dark room some light. Then Hop Frog brought his torch to the flax and the pitch, and the dangling men all did tremble and twitch, as the flame spread over the eight every one, and the meat chandelier burned as bright as the sun. And the guests stood in awe till the burning had ceased, and just eight blackened skeletons hung o'er the feast. But by then, of course, Hoprog was not to be found. It's supposed that Trippetta had waited around, some dark corner unseen, and the two made away to some faraway place where... I really can't say. Pardon my impertinence, Signora, but I believe I have the honor of addressing the Duchess di Brolio. 
Perhaps you do. Do I have the honor of addressing Mr. William Wilson? My darling, no one truly has that honor. What do you mean by that? Nothing of consequence. A private amusement of mine. Private from me? From everyone. I thought you were pulling my leg about appearing in a play. Not at all. These fellows came to my aid at a disgraceful altercation in which I found myself embroiled a few nights ago. You do seem to find yourself in a great many disgraceful embroilments. Such is life, my love. During the tussle in which these good players took my part, the fellow who normally enacts the king suffered a fractured arm. I was obligated to fill in for him out of gratitude. I feel I rather acquitted myself well in the role. You were passable. Where is your husband? Somewhere in the city, carousing with peasants. The fool adores Carnival because it affords him the chance to be with his people, as he ridiculously puts it. He will return to the palazzo after midnight, blind drunk, stinking of the common, and immediately succumb to sleep without even removing his costume. It is an annual tradition of his. I should be hidden in his chambers before then. He never touches the drapes in his bedchambers. You can secret yourself behind them. You will know when he is asleep. He snores to wake the dead. Once you hear him, you can cut his throat with ease, and everything of his will become mine. Enough wealth to go anywhere in the world. Until eleven, my love. Until eleven. Everything of his will become hers, and everything of hers will become yours, as she will suffer the same fate as her husband. Is that not the stratagem? Scoundrel! Imposter! Accursed villain! You shall not dog me unto death! Follow me, or I stab you where you stand! Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed by an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch! I cried. Thy God hath lent thee by these angels he has sent thee. Respite, respite, and nepenthe from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind nepenthe, and forget this lost Lenore. Quoth the raven. Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil, whether tempter set or whether tempest toss thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil prophet still if bird or devil, by that heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore. Tell this soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Clasp a rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend. I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave my loneliness unbroken, quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart, and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. This ends tonight. I tire of you. I tire of fleeing you in vain. Why do you haunt my steps? Why have you pursued me to the ends of the earth? In all these years, I have had no relief from you. My childhood bane, my admonisher at Eton, the destroyer of my honor at Oxford, my revenge in Paris, my passionate love in Naples, what you falsely turned my avarice in Egypt, and now my ambition in Rome. Who are you? What are you? I am William Wilson. Draw. Draw, damn you! I shall give you one last chance, one final opportunity to escape death at my hands. Who are you? I am William Wilson. I am William Wilson!
You have conquered and I yield. Yet henceforward you are also dead. Dead to the world, to heaven, and to hope. In me you existed, and in my death see by this image, which is your own, how utterly you have murdered yourself. The man's been murdered! No, I can assure you, it was self-defense. The scoundrel attacked me! Senor, do you see anyone else with him? There were so many in the crowd! Of course. Now, if you will simply let me explain... You knew the man? Yes, he was an associate of my husband's. An Englishman, or an American, perhaps. He was English by birth, so far as I know. I myself You am... saw him earlier? Yes, I ran into him in the square. He was performing with a troupe of actors. He played the king. No, senora, I played the king. If a you- strange occupation for a gentleman. It was not his occupation. He did not have an occupation. He was a gentleman of leisure. He had met their players at some tavern. Just a moment. And had gotten into some manner of altercation alongside them. I am certain the details are scandalous. That is not me! He was frequently in the company of such people. To speak the truth, he was a very low sort. Do not ignore me! Do not speak of me as though I were absent! I stand before you! You will acknowledge me! We must fetch the Polizia de Sato. What was the man's name? His name was Wilson. William Wilson. That is not me! That is not my name! That is not my name! Are you ready? I do not like this place. There's something here that... I cannot explain it. Something is near. Something terrible. There is nothing harmful here. This is a house of God. Will you not hold my hand? Pardon me, Father. May we prevail upon you to perform a ceremony? What ceremony, my son? My daughter, I am ashamed to say, has not been baptized. Ah, I noticed, my son, that she did not receive communion while you did. Would you perform it now, Father? Yes. Yes, of course. What is your name, my child? As my father said, I am, as yet, unbaptized. But you do have a name. I do not. My child, this is not a place for jest. I have never given her a name. I know it is uncommon. Unheard of. A young woman of her age? She is considerably younger than she appears. Even still. Where are the godparents? There are none. This is most irregular. Can it be done? Yes. Yes, of course. What do you wish to name the child? My son, she must have a name. When the moment arrives, I will give you the name. Come here, my child. It was many and many a year ago in the kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. In nomine Padre, e Fili, e Spiritu Santi, a baptize. The name? What is the name? Morella. I baptize you, Morella. I am here! The play is the tragedy man and its hero, the conqueror worm. Have you not seen it? Roderick? 
Have you not seen it? Have I not seen what? You have not seen it. But stay, you shall! You must not! You shall not behold this! These appearances which bewilder you are merely electrical phenomena, or they may have their ghastly origins in the rank miasma of the Tarn. Leave the window closed, Roderick. The air is chilling and dangerous to your frame. What were you reading? One of your favorite romances. The Mad Trist of Sir Lancelot Canning. Would you like for me to read it aloud? Yes, thank you. Shall I start from the beginning? No, I know it well. Continue from wherever you left off. Ethelred has just been denied entrance to the dwelling of the hermit and is about to enter by force. And Ethelred, who was by nature of a doughty heart. And Ethelred, who is by nature of a doughty heart and who was now mighty withal, on account of the powerfulness of the wine which he had drunken, waited no longer to hold parley with the hermit, but uplifted his mace outright, and with blows made quickly room in the plankings of the door for his gauntleted hand. And now, pulling whereof sturdily, he cracked and ripped and tore all asunder. But the good champion Ethelred, now entering within the door, was amazed to perceive no sign of the maliceful hermit, but instead, a dragon of a scaly and prodigious demeanor, and of a fiery tongue, which sate in guard before a palace of gold with a floor of silver, and upon the wall there hung a shield of shining brass, with this legend in written, Who entereth herein a conqueror hath been, who slayeth the dragon, the shield he shall win. And Ethelred uplifted his mace and struck upon the head of the dragon, which fell before him and gave up his pesty breath with a shriek so horrid that Ethelred had fain to close his ears with his hands against the dreadful noise of it, the like whereof was never before heard. And now the champion, having escaped from the terrible fury of the dragon, removed the carcass from out of the way before him, and approached valorously over the silver pavement of the castle to where the shield was upon the wall, which, when he reached it, fell down at his feet upon the silver floor with a mighty, great, and terrible ringing sound. That is enough of Ethelred, I think. Have you ever heard the story of Melancholy Edgar? I don't believe so. Melancholy Edgar was melancholy, you see, because his wife had died. She had died of a sea wind, or in childbirth, or she was possessed, or had consumption, but she was not. He loved her very much. So very much, his grief was overwhelming. It was the grandest of old clichés. A dark and stormy night. Melancholy Edgar sat in his study, obsessing over his dead wife when he heard a tapping at his window. Curious, he opened it. A bird flew in. A raven. A raven that could speak, but only one word. Nevermore. Yes, you have heard it. I have. It was called something else I don't remember. The poor man becomes convinced the bird is a prophet. He asks if his wife is in heaven, the bird says nevermore. And he falls into despair. Which is precisely what he wanted. To despair? Of course. He chooses his words very carefully. He does not ask if she is in heaven, until he is certain that nevermore is the only answer he will receive. It is the answer that he desires. The one that will plunge his soul into the most profound darkness. No. No, he sees the bird as a prophet because he's ill and he's grieving and- He sees the bird as a prophet because he wants to see the bird as a prophet. And he wants to see the bird as a prophet because he knows what answer it will give him. 
the one that will allow him the total luxury of despair. That is all we ever see, my friend. Only what we want to. As I was saying earlier, Melancholy Edgar's wife died. Of a sea wind or in childbirth or she was possessed or had consumption. But she was not buried alive. Project. You have heard it. You have finally heard it. I have heard it. Long, long, many minutes, many hours, many days, I have heard it. And yet, I dare not, I dare not, I dare not speak. Did I not tell you my senses were acute? I heard the first feeble movements many days ago, many, many days ago, and I did nothing. I dared not speak, but tonight, you have heard it. Ethelred. <laughs> The breaking of the hermit's door, the death cry of the dragon, and the clangor of the shield. The rending of the coffin, the grating, and the iron hinges of the vault, the struggles in the copper archway. We have put her living in the tomb! From out that shadow that lies floating on the floor shall be lifted. <laughs> 